Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Arnone. I'm the Chief Executive of the National Academy of Social Insurance. And I'm uh, really pleased to welcome all of you to today's uh, dive into the latest Social Security Trustees report. Um, we have a great group of registrants, uh, Academy members, congressional staff, and journalists uh, covering uh, Social Security. And uh, we're very pleased to be able to uh, feature uh, Steve Goss, the Chief Actuary of the uh, Social Security Administration. Uh, who will uh, provide us with the highlights of the 2021 trustees report. Uh, and then joining us as discussants will be Henry Aaron of the Brookings Institution and Tracy Groniger of Justice in Aging. I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, context uh, for today's event in terms of the Academy's uh, activities that focus on social security. Every once in a while, uh, members will say, boy, the Academy really focuses on a lot of programs these days, what about the core programs like uh, Social Security? And I want to reassure all, reassure all of you that remains a major focus of the Academy's policy work. Um, and in particular, uh, in the uh, era of COVID, uh, just wanted to uh, let you know what the Academy has done in this area. Uh, we convened a COVID-19 task force last year uh, that has two phases. The first phase was a group of 13 epidemiologists chaired by uh, Dr. Neil Poe of the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, they worked on uh, scenarios based on their understanding of the likely trajectory of the pandemic. Although I must say uh, in their deliberations, a word that permeates the Social Security Trustees report is the word uncertainty. Uh, anyone who states with certainty, they know what COVID is gonna do clearly uh, is uh, not reliable. Uh, so the epidemiology working group put together three scenarios to mirror the scenarios used by the trustees. And we submitted those to Steve in his role as chief actuary and to Steve's counterpart at CMS, Paul Spitalnik, to hope that they could be of some value in the trustee deliberations. The second phase of the COVID-19 task force has just gotten underway. And that's what we call a policy translation working group. And we're thrilled that Henry is one of the co-chairs of that group, along with Catherine Baker from the University of Chicago. Uh, and that group is deliberating. We'll be having another uh, meeting next week. And their uh, a mission is to uh, look at what the impact on social insurance programs appears to have been based on COVID, but also to look ahead and anticipate uh, future catastrophes, whether they are pandemics, economic shocks, uh, cyber attacks, climate change uh, catastrophes, and try to be more proactive in how social insurance can anticipate and deal with calamities like this. So this is a really significant time for all of us involved in social insurance to be able to frame our programs in the context of unimaginable, but quite frankly, probably likely of uh, future uh, disasters. Uh, we also issued last week a updated social security primer. Uh, we track, by the way, all of the activity on our new website. And one of the most popular downloaded items is the social security primer, which we view as a cornerstone of our attempts to educate the public about the basics of social security. We're also gonna be issuing additional resources uh, and hosting events to help policymakers and others understand the impacts of this pandemic on social insurance programs. And you'll be seeing some of them in the chat box uh, as we uh, uh, proceed with today's event. Uh, before I turn it over to Steve to kick us off, I wanna thank uh, the funders who support the Academy's COVID-19 Task Force. They include the RRF Foundation for Aging, Anthem and Arnold Ventures. And again, thank you to all of you who signed on to participate in today's discussion. We're gonna have a lot of time at the end so you can post questions. Now, here's how you do that. Uh, many of you now by now are uh, Zoom pros, you know how this works, but we just wanna remind all of you that if you wanna make comments throughout, the chat box is the uh, venue to do that. And you can have comments seen by all the panelists and the attendees if you click that on the chat feature. If you wanna post questions, and we do have some questions that you emailed 
to us in advance, uh, you wanna use the Q and A box and there you can post questions to the panelists. So please do that. And we'll look at those and feed them to uh, Steve, uh, to Tracy and to Henry. So with that, let me turn it over to Steve who will walk us through the highlights of this year's trustees report. Steve. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And um, thanks for the invite to come and talk with you and, and all who are showing up today. This is really, really nice. Uh, and let me mention also just give a shout out as you already did to your epidemiologist task force. Thanks for invitation for myself, Karen Glenn, and a couple others from our office to come and uh, chat with those folks. Uh, that's been an extremely helpful uh, 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 place to be uh, and to listen to and to learn from. Uh, and looking forward to uh, what, what Henry or Hank's uh, group is gonna be doing and thinking about policy implications. So yes, the new trustees report came out on August 31st. Uh, and we're happy to tell you about that. Uh, Tom Novotny is uh, gonna put up the slides. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, and uh, first of all on this, just wanna share with you all, uh, for those that aren't totally aware, the reason that the trustees reports are done, it's been every single year without stop since 1941. Uh, and these are required by the legislative mandate uh, that a report is produced by the trustees of the trust funds. Uh, to indicate three things, really. What's happened in the past year in terms of the operations of the trust funds, what's expected the next five years, and what the actual status is. And basically, the actual status, the reason Congress asks us for that is to see the degree to which what is scheduled in law is in sync, the degree to which the scheduled revenues will be adequate to be able to finance the scheduled benefits, and if they are not fully adequate in, in our best projections, uh, then to what extent they fall short and when, so that Congress will be informed about when and by how much they'll have to make changes. So on the next slide, uh, you can see the principal changes that we made here in the relatively near term reflecting the pandemic. Obviously the pandemic is a big deal as indicated in the red item on the top of the slide. The 2020 trustees report did not reflect the pandemic. Uh, it was new, it was only declared by the World Health Organization, I believe in March of 2020, so there wasn't really time to fully reflect it, or, uh, and the trustees report was gotten out in April. Uh, we did, by the way, uh, just so that you are aware, those who weren't, uh, our office, the chief actuary at SSA, we did do a, an update of the 2020 trustees report. I hope many of you had seen it. Uh, it was put out on November 24 of last year on our website, and we did this largely for the purpose of one of our main functions, which is working with Congress on their proposals to make sure that we have as up-to-date and accurate a baseline projection under current law as possible uh, against which to develop estimates for uh, any changes they might be considering. So we've had that up there. We've actually had several proposals from Congress that we actually did estimates for, and that again is up on the, uh, up on the webpage that you see indicated in blue at the top. Now, what were the main changes that we made in reflection of the experience we've seen so far from the pandemic and ensuing recession? The first and foremost thing, uh, which really reflects us in any recession, any economic downturn, is the lower employment and earnings uh, in the very near term. And uh, in the first half of 2020, actually the second calendar quarter, we saw a dramatic drop in gross domestic product and earnings and employment. Uh, and uh, at the time, many will recall that we were all expecting that we would have throughout that year substantially lower earnings and employment. In fact, the earnings and employment came back uh, more rapidly than we and others had anticipated as of mid last year. Uh, while we're still projecting to have earnings and employment somewhat below 2020 expectations through 2023, we're expecting a very substantial comeback and experience that later in 2020. As a result, the average wage index for calendar year 2020 as a whole turned out to be 2.7% or is expected to be 2.7% above the 2019 average wage index, where earlier on we and many others had feared it could be a decline by as much as four or five or even 6%. As it turned out, uh, earnings and employment came back to such a great degree uh, and the way it came back uh, later in 2020, we ended up with not only not a drop, but even expecting to have an increase of about 2.7%. Other impacts, of course, 
uh, were that we had increased deaths, unfortunately, during 2020 and are continuing to have increased deaths through this year. Uh, more on that uh, in a bit. We've also had some delays in births and immigration are uh, than expecting to have delays in births and immigration, although I'm really happy to report to you that some extremely early preliminary data we have, partial and preliminary for the year, indicates that the degree to which we were expecting births would be lower in 2021 is seeming not to be occurring. It seems like we were not having a drop off in the first quarter of 2021 in births relative to the first quarter even of 2020. So we are very pleased to report that it, it appears that what we have in the trustees report for, uh, for drops in births in the pandemic may not, be, uh, may not be realized to the degree we had in the trustees report. Immigration similar, uh, while we have been having some lower immigration recently and expect to in the pandemic, uh, the trustees assumptions are assumed that that will largely come back over time over the next five or six years. Many have probably been aware that applications for social security benefits, retirement, but particularly disability have been not at the level that uh, had been anticipated in the absence of a pandemic. That obviously has significant implications for the number of people starting to receive benefits and being on the rolls in 2020 and even in 2021. So uh, more on that to come. Uh, and that's something we're continuing to, to monitor. The one significant permanent item that was assumed in the insurance trustees report as a result of the pandemic was a, an assumption related really more to the recession associated with the pandemic than the pandemic itself. And that is an assumption that uh, in this, this sort of structural shift, this period of loss and recession, that we might see a little bit of a level shift downward, a little bit of a loss in the level of worker productivity that is output per hour worked by, work, by the workforce now and in the future. We had a several percentage point drop uh, from what we had been assuming from the Great Recession. At this point, uh, we and the trustees are assuming a one percentage point drop off in the level of potential GDP and, uh, and productivity going into the future. So on the next slide, we can share with you what some of the uh, uh, sort of uh, other changes are. Well, changes this year due to the pandemic and recession. Uh, well, I'm sorry, this is... Uh, okay, well, some of the, some of the implications of, of these changes, uh, any changes since the 2021, oh, here, here, what has been happening since we actually set the assumptions for the trustees report? Again, it came out at the end of August, but as you all know, it takes a while to develop a trustees report, so the assumptions were really set in May or earlier. Since the time the assumptions were set, uh, how have we done uh, on things like the average wage index in series. We will think we're really pretty much tracking that. One item of particular note is the cost of living adjustment coming up for December of this year. Uh, the trustees report suggested an expectation of 3.1%, which is well above the 1.3% for the prior year's COLA. But as it appears at this point, because of surges in energy uh, and car prices and others, it appears as though we are now expecting to be likely in the vicinity of a 6% COLA for December of 2021. So that's really an update from what we have in the trustees report not fully reflected there. Uh, with respect to increased deaths in 2020 through 2023, uh, still highly uncertain as Bill indicated, but uh, it looks like we are tracking pretty close what our expectations were so far in 2021. We and the trustees were anticipating, unfortunately, that 2020 was not gonna be the end of the recession, that last fall surge that we would have more and lo and behold, we are now seeing that uh, uh, unhappily, but that much was, uh, was anticipated by the trustees. The delays in birth, preliminary indication, as I mentioned, is that we may be having higher births than we had assumed uh, for at least the first quarter of 2021, and we are hopeful that will persist. That would be a good news story. I think many had, had been aware of the notion that, uh, uh, that everybody being at home might actually refer, result in an increase in births. Uh, there were concerns on the other hand that because of concerns about what was going uh, on with, uh, uh, with, with concerns about the pandemic that there could be lower births. So probably, you know, those two forces are acting. The question is which one will be larger. Applications already mentioned uh, for benefits. We are continuing to see uh, uh, lower than expected levels on applications for benefits, but they do appear to be starting back up. 
to towards higher levels. We will see how that goes. Uh, and with a recent, uh, to a great extent, uh, end to extended payments for unemployment uh, and pandemic relief payments, we're expecting there will be more uh, increase. Regarding the permanent loss in worker, worker productivity, too soon to tell. Uh, we will see how that works out. We will hope that we will gain that back, that the economy will come roaring back, this being different from most other economic recessions we've seen recently. So we'll hope to have the rebound, but at this point, the, the trustees have assumed a 1% level shift down in worker productivity and GDP relative to where we would be otherwise for the more long distant future. So on the next slide, uh, we, we just wanted to update you a little bit of what we've been seeing very most recently from the pandemic. Obviously a point of, of much interest. The left panel here is, well, this is way old stuff. This is back to June, 1918, uh, uh, to 1919 of what that pandemic was looking like. You can see the waves. You can see it's not too terribly different, the waves that we are seeing here uh, in the current COVID-19 pandemic so far. Uh, the bars here indicate daily levels of infections reported to the CDC. You can see, unfortunately, that in July, August, and into September, we are seeing an increase once again. The uh, orange line on that is showing you, which is of course displaced to a later point in time throughout the pandemic, what the seven day average uh, number of uh, deaths uh, is. And that of course, unfortunately is also coming back in the latest wave. So we will see how this, how this goes. Uh, so on the next slide, you can see another look that we have been doing uh, in addition to those daily reports from CDC of what is actually reported on a day by day basis. CDC also publishes every Friday at, I believe, 5 p.m., maybe 4 p.m., uh, something what they call the flu view. And on the flu view, they indicate what has been reported through a most recent week and for prior weeks, uh, where the reports are what the deaths reported that have occurred in that week. Now, if you look at the flu view, you will see, as shown on the left panel here, that for quite some time, for a number of months, uh, there is not complete reporting. Uh, of the deaths that actually occurred in a given week. Uh, the reports of deaths that occur in a given week tend to come in with a considerable lag. And you can see uh, the blue and black lines are showing what had been reported to date uh, at uh, August 28 and August 14. <clears throat> the red line is based on an analysis of the way the lags have been working on these reports uh, over the past year. What we're expecting will be the actual numbers of deaths occurring. Uh, in that particular period of time. The left panel is uh, the average number of uh, total weekly deaths, a ratio to what had occurred in this, at the far end of this graph <clears throat> compared to a couple of years ago. You can see it's, it's elevating again, unfortunately. The right-hand panel shows you uh, the expected complete deaths. Here, the black line is for total deaths, the excess over what we would otherwise be expecting uh, uh, on the black line, but you can see then differentiated on the blue line is the excess on the number of deaths occurring from pneumonia, influenza, and COVID grouped all together uh, as, as uh, CDC nicely does, as compared to uh, the differentiation from a couple years ago on deaths on the red line, which are excluding COVID and pneumonia and influenza. This gives you sort of a sense of what the pandemic is really looking like Unfortunately, we are in another wave now. We're hoping this will be short-lived and maybe it'll be the last one, uh, but, uh, but uh, most epidemiologists are suggesting to us that we're not quite out of the woods yet. So that's sort of the latest update on what we have relative to COVID. Uh, on the next slide, we can show you what some of the primary longer-term changes are, not really so much related to COVID, but, but other things. One thing really to note, and there's been some interest in discussion of this already uh, since the report's been out for a little while, is we made some significant changes in the way we project birth rates in the future. Uh, in the past, we used to take every single year, look at the birth rates that occurred to women of all different ages in the given year, what we call the period total fertility rate, and just project that going forward and project that it would get to its ultimate level a mere 10 years later. What we've done now is, is reflect the understanding we gained actually back in the 1970s and 1980s uh, from what was happening with women starting to move towards having their children at higher ages for any number of reasons, career development, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that was occurring in the 70s and 80s. We see the same thing really going on now. 
And as a result, we've changed our methodology to reflect our projections of birth rates on the basis of a cohort method, which means looking at women born in a given year and looking at uh, what the birth rates appear to be happening for them. In that way, we can capture the fact that in a given cohort, if uh, women are having fewer children, say in their 20s, they might be having more children in their 30s. And that's exactly what's been happening uh, on this. So we're projecting more of that to be going on. Uh, we did in the process of this, uh, by, by developing it this way, we actually have lower birth rates assumed through 2036 than we had in last year's trustees report. By 2056 under the new methodology, we reached the ultimate assumed total fertility rate of 2.0, which is still, again, lower than what even today uh, or in 2017 and 19, women have been reporting as their expectation for the total number of births they'll have on average, which is about 2.1. So uh, we are still projecting that ultimately women will have fewer births than they're suggesting when they're in their 20s and 30s, they might expect to have. But in the cohort method, we're, we're really very much extending the time period over which we get to the ultimate level that's assumed. Uh, and I should mention that the combination of the uh, uh, ultimate total fertility rate that we've got at 2.0, along with our new that actually is resulting in a slightly lower actuarial balance, uh, slightly less positive effect for the long-term uh, financing for social security, and especially in the near term. But on balance, we think this is really a, a, a better methodology and a better approach. Uh, another item that we made that also I should mention has only a small effect, but, but we think has big ramifications for the accuracy and reliability of our projections is on the employment side. We updated our labor force model, which in the prior trustees report was based on experience only towards the beginning of the Great Recession, but did not include the economic cycle that started with the Great Recession, 2007 through 2019. So we have now incorporated that additional period that's a period most will be aware that we've tended to have lower labor force participation rates overall than in prior years, but we also on a state of the economy basis been having lower unemployment rates. So uh, given that our employment projections under the old model had actually been quite good, we've not only modified our labor force model, but also our long-term unemployment rate uh, in sync. Uh, and as you'll see in a later slide, uh, our, our overall projections of employment are really quite similar to last year, but we think we have a much better methodology for making that projection. On the death rate side, other than the near-term effects from COVID. No. Henry? Sorry. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, on, on, uh, other than the near-term uh, death rates from COVID, we uh, also have made some, some sort of minor, not terribly large, uh, changes on mortality, we split out dementia as a separate cause out of what had been referred to earlier as the other causes of death. Uh, the reason, uh, because dementia has really been acting differently from many other causes. It has unfortunately been showing increasing levels of death rates. The trend is not good. Uh, and so we figured we should split that out uh, and, and treat that separately from the others. In addition, one other item that uh, uh, actually has uh, an impact as well, is rates improvement for cardiovascular. All of us know that over the last 30 or 40 years, amazing progress has been made in diminishing cardiovascular disease and deaths from it. Uh, but we seem to be perhaps putting in a certain terms, of kind of running out of gas a little bit on that. Uh, the, the returns have been diminishing somewhat so we uh, have modified to a little bit slower rate of improvement on cardiovascular, uh, given the amazing progress that's been made so far. It looks as though further progress will come at a slower pace. Uh, one other item that is of significance is uh, we get information from the Office of Tax Analysis at Treasury on the relationship between benefits and income taxes on Social Security benefits, which by the way, since the 1983 amendments, have been accruing to the Social Security and Medicare HI trust funds. So that's important. We do not have access to the micro data on tax returns to be able to develop that. So we work with office tax analysis. They gave us a refreshed analysis based on more recent data, which suggests that our taxation of benefits revenue may not be quite as large as we had projected in the prior trustees report, therefore somewhat of a loss to the trust funds uh, reflected in our methods uh, this year. Uh, other, a number of other methods were made primarily affecting average benefit levels, which also had effects, but we'd need, a, we'd need a few more hours bill if we could afford that. 
to get into great detail on that. So that said, maybe we should go to the next slide. And the next slide, uh, just to give you an, an, uh, an, interest, an interesting point of what a lot of people point to, they think most importantly, and may or may not be, depends on your perspective, from the results actually that come out of the trustee projections. Uh, and in truth, remember that the whole reason for the report is to advise Congress about uh, when we might have shortfalls and when they might have to act. So the date at which we project that the depletion of the reserves will occur, that is in effect the savings account for the trustees, uh, 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 for, the trust, for the trust funds, when those reserves might become depleted. Uh, and basically the changes this year, at least for OESI trust fund and for the combined old age survivors insurance and disability insurance trust fund are really almost exclusively reflected from what's happened recently in the pandemic. Uh, you can see that the combined OESI and DI trust funds that we tend to look at most, uh, we're projecting a one year earlier reserve depletion date, not 2035 as in the 2020 trustees report, but 2034. And by the way, this is the same as we had projected in our November 24 update. Uh, however, please keep in mind that reserve depletion does not mean uh, that uh, the trust funds are out of money. Uh, that is merely that the, the accrued savings from prior year's excess payroll taxes coming in that had been saved up will be used up, but we project we will still have 78 cents coming in in current payroll tax revenue for every dollar of scheduled benefits as of 2034 at the point of the combined reserve depletion. So that's a long way from not being able to pay benefits. What this really tells Congress is they better act by 2034 for the combined program. And what, what is a shortfall? A 22% shortfall that has to be made up either with more revenue or by trimming benefits or some combination. For the OESI trust fund alone, and by the way, the OESI and DI trust funds are distinct legal entities, so we have to pay attention to those. Uh, the OESI trust fund is also projected to deplete as we had estimated in November of last year, one year earlier, not 2034, but now 2033. And the degree to which we will be short in terms of current revenue, if that were to happen, and Congress were to not act up to that point, would be 76% uh, uh, coming in for every uh, dollar that we have scheduled benefits. So obviously some work to be done there by Congress. Uh, we hope sooner rather than later as always, <clears throat> but we will stay tuned and keep working with Congress as we always have on, on developing proposals that they will be putting forth and enacting we hope before and maybe well before 2033. The DI reserve depletion date, you might recall in the 2020 trustees report, was projected all the way out to 2065. Now it's projected 2057, which is still far more in the future than the others. Uh, it is eight years earlier, but uh, the reason that it, it, it became earlier by eight years instead of only one year for the other fund uh, is because there's many more years for any shortfalls to accrue uh, as a result of what we have in the trustees report. And also you can tell by virtue of the fact that at that time we're projecting to still have 91% of the cost of the program covered uh, by, uh, by continuing revenue, that what that means is the, the reserve depletion date is much more variable for DI because the trajectory of the reserves is, uh, is much tighter. That is the, the revenue coming in and the expenditures are much closer together. So a small change in the amount of money that we have available in the trust funds can, can make that date of reserve depletion ha, uh, change by more years. But still 2057 is a long way away. And I should mention, by the way, that our reserve depletion date, uh, while projected for the combined funds is now 2034 over the last 30 years, it's been in a range of, uh, I believe, 2029 to 2042. So we're right in the middle of that. Uh, so there's been a fair amount of variation, but it's fairly consistent what, what the reserve depletion date's been projected to be. So on the next slide, this is just a quick run on the other way of looking at the long-term actuarial status of the program, the so-called actuarial balance. This really just gives a summarized view of what our shortfalls are, in this case, over the next 75 years. And you can see at the bottom line here, the net change in our shortfall is a negative 0.32% of payroll. Remember, a way to think about that is, by looking at things as a percent of payroll, that's sort of equivalent to what like a tax rate would be, an easy way to sort of get a, get a handle on what percent of payroll means, our 12.4% tax rate. 
Uh, that means that the amount by which we would have to increase to fully cover the scheduled benefits would be 0.32% more than we were estimating last year. So we, we naturally have, because of the changing valuation date, adding on one extra year to our 75 year period at the end, that tends to increase our uh, negative actuarial balance, our actuarial shortfall a little bit, as you can see. Legislation, we had a very small increase in the shortfall, that because of the assumption that we will be restoring and maintaining the DACA program uh, uh, this year, where last year it was assumed to be, uh, uh, to be terminated. Uh, on demographic assumptions overall, there's a very small reduction in the actuarial balance. Uh, you might recall I mentioned earlier that on the birth rates alone, we have that much change, uh, a very small negative from the birth rate change, even though we're upping the uh, expected ultimate way far in the future uh, achieved birth rate for women, still below what their expectations are even today. Uh, the change in the method was sufficient to cause us to actually have a little bit of a negative there. The net effect of the, uh, of the effects uh, from mortality, immigration, and other near-term updates was, was essentially negligible. So, so birth rates could be argued to be sort of a, the main driver uh, in the change there. On the economic side, we have more effects from the economic side. Part of that is really due to the change in the long-term productivity level mentioned earlier, and also the uh, taxation of benefits assumptions that we got from office tax analysis. Those were the largest contributed towards the negative as because as mentioned before, the employment numbers are really, uh, are really very much uh, as we had projected it last year. There were other changes and improvements in our methodologies particularly the way we're projecting starting levels of benefits. And some of the changes there actually had what turns out to be the largest negative effect uh, uh, fully accounting for half of the overall change in this. And again, at a, at a point, maybe we'll have a much longer session, uh, Bill, if people are interested in, in talking more about those methodologies. So on the next slide, uh, we, we now will have some pictures which will probably go faster. So on this one, this is the, I hope, very familiar to everybody, what we like to refer to as the trust fund ratios. This is the ratio of our trust fund reserves, the amount that is sort of saved up from excess revenue coming in in the past as a percentage of the annual cost of the program. And note that because we are basically a pay-as-you-go system, the intent here is to try to keep around 100% or more for the level of the reserves, uh, because again, recall the trust funds only have available what's in the trust fund reserves to pay benefits, no borrowing authority. So we really try to keep, uh, keep these reserves up at 100% level. So when we start getting below 100%, that is a point at which we gain some concern and we are hoping Congress will act. You can see how, not only the points at which we'll get below 100% in our projections for the various trust funds, the blue being the DI trust fund alone, the uh, red being the OESI trust fund and the black being the combined funds. And you can see here where the projected reserve depletion dates are and how they changed relative to where we uh, had been in the prior trustees report. So on the next slide, you can see a little bit different look. This is a look at what our projected non-interest income is. That's basically the tax revenue coming to the, into the program and the cost of providing the scheduled benefits. Uh, for the program are relative to our payroll tax base. Uh, and you can see the, the dumpster income is pretty much a flat line. It's close to the 12.4% payroll tax rate, plus a little bit extra for the revenue from taxation of benefits. The line that's more interesting is the blue line, which is the cost of providing the full scheduled benefits. And you can see, of course, how that is rising as we've been projecting for many, many years now, uh, rising to the point uh, where we reach our projected reserve depletion date in 2034 for the combined trust funds. At that point, then we show a dashed line which shows what the cost of providing full scheduled benefits would be, but show a solid line of what would happen literally under current law, the amount that we would have available to pay benefits. Uh, and we indicate in the box below that as of 2034, as mentioned earlier, we would have 78% of the necessary revenue for paying full scheduled benefits actually available in 2034. That's pretty stable. We dropped down to 74% available as of 2095 in our projections. Again, this has been pretty consistent over time. So we do have this rather interesting level shift uh, on, on the cost rate. 
On the next slide, you can see a little bit different look here. We often like to look at not just what sometimes referred to as solvency in the prior slide, but sustainability. We would really worry about the sustainability of the program if the cost, say, as percent of GDP as represented here, uh, continued going up as, as is happening between 2008 and 2035 or 40. If it was continued going up that trajectory, we would have a serious issue. But as it happens, that's not the case. We have, in effect, what we've sort of referred to as a level shift. We have the cost as percentage of GDP, as we saw as a percentage of payroll, rising pretty substantially from 2008 to 2040, but then pretty much stabilizing the level here at about 6% of GDP. Again, the point to Congress is, what should we do? Should we pull down the cost of the program by changing benefit schedule, or should we raise revenue or some combination? Now, on the next slide, you can see really the reason why we have that jump up from 2008 to 2040. And again, it's really, it's as oftentimes is the case, it's pretty much largely about demographics. This is just a little plot of what we call the age of dependency ratio. Uh, for any of us who might be over 65, we take a little bit of umbrage of this, but bottom line, this is the ratio of people 65 and older, which is a pretty decent representation of sort of where our beneficiaries come from divided by the number of people 20 to 64, which to a large extent represents where our workers who are paying payroll taxes come from. You can see between 2008 and 2035 or 40, this curve just moves up very rapidly as the baby boomers slide over from working ages into retirement ages, but the curve stays up very substantially. Uh, and why? Well, if you look at the blue and red lines, you can see the real reason why this curve is jumping up so much. It's really because of the drop in birth rates after the baby boom period. Had the birth rate stayed at the 3.3 level that we experienced during the baby boom period, we would be traveling on this age of dependency ratio at the red line. And we would really not have, be having anything like the kinds of increases in cost that we're actually seeing now and are projecting. If, if, they, if the birth rates had even stayed at three children per woman after 1964, which is kind of pretty much the average in periods before 1965, not even counting just the baby boom, we would also be at a relatively stable level for the age of dependency ratio. But lo and bold, that hasn't happened. Birth rates dropped from the three level down to more like two, uh, very much more recently, uh, uh, even lower than that. We expect that's gonna be temporary, but we will see. But you can see it's really the effects of the lower birth rates that have fundamentally changed the age distribution of our population. More uh, over 65, fewer between 20 and 64, and that fundamentally changes the cost as percentage of payroll and GDP for the program, uh, that which Congress will have to address. So on the next slide, uh, you can see a little bit of the comparison, we'll go into great detail on this, but for those who want to sort of study this more later, this is two little looks at birth rates. Uh, the one on the left is the way we have typically tended to look at birth rates in the past, the what we call period total fertility rates. That is uh, sort of the, an, an indication of the births occurring in a year for women of all different ages. Whereas on the right-hand slide, you can see what we uh, have seen historically and what we're projecting for the birth rates on a cohort basis here indicated by the birth year of women and the average number of children we expect women in that birth year to have throughout their lifetime. You can see that for women attaining age 49 through, uh, through 2020, which is the birth cohort here of, uh, of, of 1971, uh, we can see that in fact, the birth rates for that cohort relative to earlier reports has actually been rising. And we're projecting even with the big drop off in birth rates we've seen recently and are projecting for the next few years, that that will continue to rise. It will then wane relative to the uh, birth rates we've seen uh, recently. And even we're projecting to have a period where the completed birth rates for cohorts will be below 2.0 for a while before then coming back up uh, later in the period back out at around 2056 for, for women born out in around 2006. So that's just a little bit of a look uh, at what we're now doing on birth rates. And as I indicated, it's a slight negative for the trust funds relative to what we projected in the prior trustees report but we think we have really a, a more complete and, and, and rational sort of way of projecting the birth rates going to the future now, something we're gonna pay much more attention to uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis. On the next chart, 
we see what's been happening with death rates and no surprise to anybody here. You've seen that in fact, our death overall on a sex adjusted basis and overall deaths are about 6% elevated from what our non-pandemic expectations had been in the 2020 trustees report uh, under COVID and the 2021 trustees report for the year 2020. We are projecting a still about a 15% elevation in 2021. So uh, we did not have knowledge at the time the trustees report was developed of the surge that we are seeing now based on Delta, but nonetheless, we're anticipating that we would be seeing more surges. So uh, I think we, we, we and the trustees did a pretty good job at anticipating this. We were very hopeful, I have to admit, uh, that we would be proven so wrong and the death rates would drop down dramatically in 2021. Not so far, but you can see, however, the, the, the extra that we're seeing for 2022 and 2023 were only a 4% elevation and a 1% elevation for those two years respectively, and we will see. So, uh, so on the next slide, you can see, this is just an illustration of what I mentioned before about employment. We did make uh, changes in the labor force and unemployment rates. And basically we're, we're for our age sex adjusted employment rate, this is the ratio of employment to population. Uh, is basically the same in the more distant future after we get past the pandemic as we had in the prior trustees report. So we've been doing well, but for the pandemic on those projections. And so our, our net effect here is about the same. Interestingly, however, the projection of employment to population and our new methodologies is showing a little bit of a close in the gap between men and women uh, going forward. We think that uh, makes sense and we will see in the future if, if that trend continues. On the next slide, uh, you can see just a little pictorial view of what I mentioned earlier about the 1% drop off and the level of potential GDP here uh, uh, caused by a presumption of a 1% drop off in the level of output per hour that is worker productivity uh, as a result of the pandemic and going forward. You can see when we go all the way back to 2007, what we were projecting in the 2010 trustees report, the black line for potential GDP and how much we have dropped off from that as we move towards the 2020 and 2021 trustees reports, indicating that we really did have fairly substantial reductions in GDP and in labor productivity uh, as a result of a, a permanent sort of loss relative to the Great Recession. We are assuming and expecting that we'll have much less of that going on uh, in the future from this recession. So I see Bill showing up, so I see we better, I'm not seeing the time on my computer, but I assume time is marching on and I should be, uh, I, I, see, I feel the pressure, Bill. So if we can go to the next slide, Tom, we'll try to move through this uh, kind of quickly. The next few slides we'll go through very quickly. This is just an indication that while the trustees and we assume the same ultimate total fertility uh, on the same ultimate disability incidence rate of five per thousand people exposed to being insured but not receiving disability benefit, in the future, the experience on disability applications you can see across all ages has been dropping quite dramatically, even not counting the recession and the, uh, and the pandemic. It's been dropping ever since 20, uh, uh, 2010, uh, very dramatically to very, very low levels. And the next slide you can see on a more aggregated level what's happening with uh, uh, disabled worker receipts. These are applications uh, that are disability determination services. And you can see since 2016, these have been well below the levels we'd seen prior to the Great Recession and continuing down. Now, we don't think that the drop that we've seen in 2020, uh, a number of reasons that have contributed to that is necessarily foretelling the future. And you can see our latest projections are on the yellow line here that we will have a rather steep increase back on applications for disability in the future. Uh, of course, this is something we're all scratching our heads about is this dramatic drop since 2010 and especially since 2016, is this telling us something about more of the sort of nature of work in our economy and perhaps we should not be assuming uh, quite so high a return? Something we'll be discussing and thinking about a lot. And on the next slide, you can see the way the applications flow through into disability incidents, much the same thing. Incidents here is the number of people newly starting to receive benefits relative to the number who are uh, insured in the population, you can see how much that's been dropping and how much more it's been dropping than we have been projecting in all the prior trustees reports, 2012 through 2020. Uh, and for the 2021 trustees report, will we have the surge back up that we're projecting here? We will see. 
uh, again, uh, something that uh, we're going to be looking at very careful in the future. So on the next slide, uh, the one other look at the disabled workers you can see back in the 2008 trustees report, we were projecting that number to continue growing. And in fact, after the little surge in the Great Recession, you can see the drop in disabled workers in receipt of benefits, how much it's been. So you can see how much we were over projecting way back when, uh, something we're going to have to pay a lot more attention to going forward. And the next slide, I think we're getting near the end, Bill. Uh, so what is Congress going to have to do? Congress is going to have to make choices indicated. Uh, as of 2033, uh, for the OESI fund and for the combined funds, by about that time or after 2033, they're going to have to make changes that will either enhance and increase our revenue by about a third or uh, lower the scheduled benefits by a fourth or some combination of the two. The one thing we know for sure is that enacting such changes sooner uh, allows more possibilities for the Congress to consider a more gradual phase in and more advanced notice to all of those who will be affected. So we are always, and our, our trustees are always encouraging uh, that. And on the next slide, which I think may be our last, which is just a little sales pitch for Austin Chief Actuary, please uh, go to our website early and often, and you can find all kinds of good stuff there, we hope, including the trustee report itself. And with that, Bill, uh, thank you very much, and uh, pass the baton back. Well, Steve, thank you. Thank you, uh, as always, for providing the service to our members. Uh, the key findings and, uh, most importantly, the factors driving the findings. So people have a much more enlightened view of the uh, report itself and the consequences for uh, Social Security. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to our two discussants. We'll start with Tracy Groniger. By the way, Tracy chaired uh, the Social Security workshop at our last policy conference. And that conference kicked off our multi-year campaign for pathways to economic security. Stay tuned for more details on that campaign, which will include a focus on social security and its role in reducing economic insecurity, and also uh, how the campaign can support the Academy's ongoing work on social security. So let me turn it over to Tracy. And Tracy, you'll turn it over to Henry. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Tracy Groniger. As Bill mentioned, I'm with Justice and Aging, and I want to thank you all for having me here today. Um, I apologize. I have to leave a little early, so I won't be around to answer questions, but I'm happy to answer questions that come up um, at a later time. So feel free to still put them in the chat and Bill will get them to me. Um, I wanted to talk today pretty briefly um, about what stood out to me in the trustees report and questions that I had or thought that we should be considering. Um, I especially wanted to raise the issue of racial equity um, and really think out loud about how the report might be useful for a addressing it. So just to start, I mean, I think first off, it was really heartening to see that the pandemic didn't impact the trust fund solvency by as much as maybe we feared. Um, I think that we all breathed kind of a like sigh of relief, like, okay, it's, it's a year, but it, it could have been worse. And so that's a positive thing. Um, I also just wanted to highlight how um, the program is working well, because I think that that is something to really think about and look at, and especially looking from that perspective of racial equity, social security has really been key to reducing economic disparities um, between families of color and white families. Um, we know that black seniors are more likely than others to face financial insecurity when they retire, um, which is the result of black older adults being less likely to have um, significant financial assets and home equity and retirement accounts compared to white older adults. They're also less likely to have workplace ret retirement plans, um, and they're more likely to work in low wage jobs um, where so they are less likely to be able to save for the future working in a low wage job where they are really trying to afford their expenses in the present. Um, we also know that Social Security is a very big poverty reducer, um, and it is 
pretty significant for Black seniors. Uh, without Social Security, we would see poverty rates around 51% for Black seniors. When you include Social Security, however, it drops down to 19%, which is still twice the rate of white older adults, but it is significantly lower. And so we need to really acknowledge that um, Social Security also provides benefits for workers who experience a disability and for the dependents of workers who die before they reach retirement. And that obviously benefits um, people of color and families of color who experience higher rates of disability and premature death. So that said, there's a lot of good coming out of the social security program. And we're happy to see that COVID didn't significantly hurt the trust fund. Uh, one thing that I did notice um, as I was reading the report that feels like a bit of the a hole in the data and the information provided is a lack of information about people of color. Uh, now, President Biden issued an executive order on advancing racial equity that tasked federal agencies with identifying barriers to access for underserved communities, which included people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ individuals, and others. And Obviously, there's a discussion in the report around age, there's discussion around sex, there's also discussion of the impact of immigration, but there's not really any mention of how the changing demographics of the country might also have an impact on the trust fund or just discussions about the overall differences in the eligibility or use of social security benefits by people of color and how that might have an impact. So I just kind of had kind of questions or things that I thought would be useful to know. Um, and that included things like the growth of older adults of color who are collecting benefits, um, how different racial and ethnic groups use social security and how that might affect solvency in future years. One thing in particular I thought of was um, for older black men who have earlier mortality rates, for example, how does the growth of a senior population with higher mortality at an earlier age affect the trust fund or, or does it? Um, there's also a difference in rates of disability, and I wondered how the trust fund is affected by a larger group of people who might be collecting benefits for a longer period of time. Um, and then I also just wanted to know whether the actuary's calculations are taking all of that into account or whether the data is kind of skewed toward white seniors because they are currently a larger percentage of the older adult demographic. And I think that Steve knows the answer to all of these questions. So I'm hoping that even after I'm gone, he'll be able to answer some of them. Um, but taking all of these things into account really seems relevant in deciding how we can make sure that the trust fund remains solvent in a way that is also equitable. And I would argue, for example, that proposals for raising the retirement age would potentially help the trust fund, but it might be at the expense of older adults of color who don't actually live as long as white seniors, but whose benefits are calculated as though they do. Um, and then another reason that I think it would be helpful to know these things is that SSA is engaging in outreach efforts to improve service to underserved populations. And I think this kind of data could be helpful in their work and the trustees report might even change as a result. Um, so you might see, for example, um, information about how the racial composition of SSDI and SSI beneficiaries has changed. Um, as enrollment has declined recently, you might look at whether workers of color are disproportionately losing out on benefits. And maybe SSA, if it were able to significantly improve its outreach, um, the assumptions of the trustee might even change. Um, so I would just be curious to know um, a lot of these things and have it more explicitly um, spelled out in the report so that we can kind of see more clearly where there might be issues, gaps, problems, or areas that we should be addressing. And then finally, I wanted to know 
or I would be curious to know uh, what it would take to collect and use and really highlight that data, because I assume that there are challenges. Um, and I wonder whether um, SSA might be able to work with other government agencies or identify methods of collection they hadn't thought of before, but just kind of getting a sense of how it could be done and what could make this um, a reality, because I think it would be really useful to, to know. And then finally, I had kind of some other thoughts, just more generally wondering about the effect um, from COVID on women's employment. Um, we saw a lot of women in particular dropping out of the workforce during COVID and a lot of low wage workers who are mostly women. And I just wonder what that means for the future. Um, are we possibly going to see a lot of workers whose benefits are much lower and less able to support them in the future when they retire? Um, and how does that affect the decisions that we make about expanding the program or making decisions about how we make the trust fund solvent? Um, and then finally, just looking at low wage workers and wondering about any particularly negative impacts in general for them in terms of retirement benefits in the future. So those are some of my thoughts and I'm happy to hear Steve's response and think through related questions and other considerations. And I wanna thank you all for letting me speak today. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, and let me start by endorsing your requests for information and your concerns as well. Uh, Steve, as usual, has given a thorough and very clear summary of the main findings of the trustees report. I want also to underscore that the assumptions and methods that his office uses in preparing these annual projections are subject to rather unusual scrutiny. First of all, panels appointed by the Social Security Advisory Board regularly vet the trustees' assumptions. And those panels include distinguished economists, demographers, actuaries, and other social scientists. Uh, the assumptions on which these projections rest are also subject uh, uh, are also subject to reviews by staffs of cabinet departments whose secretaries sign the report. Now, agreement is never complete. There's a lot of disagreement in those discussions, but I think the assumptions that are used are all within a plausible range. Uh, and in addition to all that, the Office of the Actuary is in frequent dialogue with staff of the Congressional Budget Office as well. Now, everyone, I think, agrees that Social Security can pay all the benefits now and for the next decade or more that are scheduled in current law. They also agree that for the long run, the program now schedules more in benefits than current revenue sources are projected to cover. And all, I would stress, analysts agree that something should be done to close the projected long-term funding gap, and the sooner, the better. The trustees have actually been at the vanguard of those calling for action. For example, this year's trustees report contains a paragraph that begins, and I'm going to quote it. The trustees recommend that lawmakers address the projected trust fund shortfall in a timely way in order to phase in necessary changes gradually and give workers and beneficiaries time to adjust to them. Now, this isn't the first time the report has said that. Last year's report, the, run, the, one, the report before that one, in fact, every port, report since 2001 at least, I didn't look at earlier reports, contained a longer or shorter paragraph that began with a similar sentence. Every one of them adjured legislators to act promptly to deal with a forthcoming gap that has been clearly visible for decades. I can't overemphasize that informed observers in general and the trustees reports in particular have long recognized that a shortfall would be occurring and roughly speaking, when it would occur. In fact, if every actuarial assumption made in the 1983 trustees report 
That's the one that was issued just after the 19, major 1982 Social Security legislation, the last time that Congress enacted a major Social Security bill. If every assumption in that report had turned out to be spot on, Social Security would now face a long-term funding gap nearly two thirds as large as the one that Steve just got through describing. To be sure, we've had some bad economic news over the last 40 years and uh, disability claims have been higher than were anticipated back then. But let me put it this way. The trustees have done a vastly better job at anticipating the future than Congress has done in reacting to it. The challenge we face today is not a result of imperfect forces, but of political procrastination. Closing the gap will, as the trustees report indicate, require sizable in tax increases or benefit cuts or both. Congress doesn't like doing either of those things. But we shouldn't infer from congressional aversion from raising taxes or cutting benefits that the challenges it faces are insuperable or even very large. The long-term gap between scheduled benefits and projected revenues measured over the projection period is equal to just 1.2% of gross domestic product. That isn't trivial. But this gap is smaller than the size of tax cuts that Congress enacted during the Bush administration and those made during the Trump administration if various revenue reducing provisions are made permanent. It is smaller than the size of payroll tax increases that Congress has enacted in the past. To treat the challenge of putting social security in long-term balance as somehow something Herculean is inaccurate. But for those who have supported the Bush and Trump tax cuts that I just mentioned, to do so is dishonest and hypocritical. The bottom line is that sometimes in the next decade, Congress is going to deal with the social security funding gap. Doing so will pose political challenges. There can be no doubt about that, but it's also an opportunity. Some things have changed in the United States since 1982 and social security should be modified to deal with them. For starters, and most importantly, social security has always been progressive. That is, it has provided more generous benefits in relation to earnings for those with low earnings than it has provided to those with high earnings. But changes in life expectancy over the last 40 years have eroded that progressivity. Life expectancy at the top of the income ladder has increased a lot. Life expectancy at the bottom of the income ladder uh, the increases have been negligible. The benefit structure should be modified, in my view, to restore progressivity. More specifically, a provision intended to boost benefits for long-term low earners has eroded and largely vanished. It should be restored and expanded. This special minimum benefit was intended to boost benefits for this group but because of quirks in indexing, it now applies to virtually no new beneficiaries. Given the sharp increase in earnings inequality over the past few decades, my view is that this provision should be restored and strengthened. And finally, Congress should provide administrative budgets to the Social Security Administration that are adequate to work down the excessively lengthy waiting periods for final disability determinations. These are some, but not all, of changes in social security structure that are needed in my view to bring social security in line with economic and social changes that have transpired in the last few decades. So both for reasons of financial prudence 
and to modernize the system, early action is desirable. For those who take pride in the creation of social security, America's largest domestic program and its most powerful anti-poverty program, failure to restore financial balance when they have the power to do so is in my view, rashly short-sighted. But wherever you stand on the original social security bill, uh, everyone I believe should urge Congress to act now. The reason repeatedly stated in the trustees reports, unfortunately ignored is to repeat so that Congress can phase in necessary changes gradually and give workers and beneficiaries time to adjust to them. Thanks and over to questions and to, back to Steve. Thank you, uh, Henry, and uh, thanks again to Tracy in her absence. Uh, Steve, do you want to respond to some of the points that uh, were made? Oh, would love to, and, and wonderful and incredibly important points by both Tracy and, and Henry. Uh, thank you so much on that. Uh, you know, first, first to, to Henry's, I'm in the last point about the ability for Congress to react uh, and to make changes. Uh, so I'm so happy to, to share with you all that our office works consistently and, and, and at all times with, with various members of Congress on both sides of the aisle about ideas they have for making changes that would both improve the system uh, by, their, by their measure, uh, we go with their goals, uh, and also improve the uh, financial actual status of the program. So we're much looking forward to that happening and the sooner the better. Uh, that uh, Henry is exactly right on that. One thing about the adequacy of benefits, uh, some might know sort of the technical term of what Henry was referring to as the special minimum benefit provision. Uh, and the problem with that is the sort of underpinnings of the special minimum benefit pr provision have been indexed over time only by the CPI. And fortunately, average wage growth has been at a higher level on average than prices. Uh, and what that means is the special minimum, exactly as Henry indicated, has, has dissipated a way to being at this point uh, applicable to almost nobody. Uh, we've seen a number of provisions. We have some on our website uh, for, for enhancing the special minimum or having other variations on that theme. Uh, no question about it. One of the things I would mention too, uh, that would be way of, uh, by way of an enhancement. Another item to keep in mind is should there be uh, included in the next big package following on the 83 amendments that followed that 1982 Greenspan Commission, uh, should the next package include a further increase in the normal retirement age? One thing to keep in mind there is a way in which uh, one can address the sort of difference uh, in people by income level, at least, uh, is a provision that uh, the simpson Bowles Commission back in 2010 uh, included which was to say, if you're gonna raise the retirement age to uh, don't raise it at all for people who have long careers with earnings below a certain level. If you lose 25 or 30 years of work uh, at less than 250% of poverty, uh, they would have a lessened and below something like 150% of poverty, there'd be no increase in the retirement age at all. Uh, that's important because if you increase the retirement age by one year, that's equivalent to sort of lowering your lifetime benefits regardless of when you start them as a retiree by about six and a half percent. So uh, so if retirement age is to be a part of the next big change, there are ways to sort of address differences by, by people's uh, past work and income level. Uh, to the, the very, very important points that Tracy was making about uh, race and ethnicity differential, uh, right on target, the President Biden has put forth an executive order that all the agencies have been being very careful attention to are acting commissioner, Kololo Kijikazi. And, uh, and uh, if, uh, if Bill has not said anything about Kololo so far in this, uh, uh, in this podcast or whatever we're calling this, I will not be surprised if he does by the end, but uh, talked with Kololo earlier today uh, and uh, SSA as an entity is working very, very deliberately and hard on enhancing our understanding and ways we can address uh, disparities uh, by race and ethnicity. Uh, I, I would just share with you that the data on race and ethnicity 
uh, is not everything we wish it would be. We're working on, on getting all we can out of it and enhancing it. Uh, one little indication of something we have already developed and, and is available on the web uh, is for one of the regulatory changes that has been put into uh, effect over the past several months uh, for changing the regulatory requirements for disability for a musculoskeletal impairment. Uh, Kualu and others uh, from the White House asked us to do an analysis of the relative impacts on that by race and ethnicity. Uh, the data we had available was not everything we would like, but we put up what we could. And you can see that again up on the SSA.gov slash uh, OECT uh, under, uh, under proposals. Uh, we have a little bit of analysis by race and ethnicity of the implication of that. And trust me, more to come on that. But the one other point, and, uh, and Tracy was exactly right about uh, the fact that we do not have everything as explicitly laid out by race and ethnicity as we might desire. However, I'm happy to share with you that the projections in the trustees report do at least implicitly reflect trends that have been occurring to date in shifts in our population by geography, by age, by sex, and by race and ethnicity. However, primarily by the proxy of uh, the levels of, of lifetime earnings that people have had. Uh, uh, and, and, and obviously people with lower lifetime earnings uh, end up with lower benefits. However, a higher replacement rate, a higher benefit level relative to their earnings, which is part of the, uh, uh, part of the progressivity that, that Henry was talking about. That's very much there and could be enhanced. Many proposals have suggested doing that. Uh, and one other way in which I just wanna share with you a little technical on the way in which changing uh, nature of, uh, of differential mortality for people at different earnings levels is and has been reflected in the historical data and our projections is that we recognize that for people who become eligible for and start receiving a benefit at a given point in time, if we follow that group of people through time, we can see very directly that the average benefit amongst that group does not grow solely with the cost of living adjustments that we have every year. It tends to grow faster than that. And the reason it grows faster is obviously because people with lower lifetime earnings, with lower career earnings, do tend to have higher mortality rates and die sooner, thereby leaving the survivors of a given group of people becoming eligible in a year uh, who live to much higher ages, being the ones with longer, uh, longer and stronger careers and therefore higher benefits. So we do have these effects very much reflected uh, in our projections. Uh, we do not have them explicitly broken out. We may have more of an opportunity to do that in the future with, with better sourcing of data. But the one thing I think we can commit to is that uh, at least at least external to the trustees reports, we will be providing and others at SSA will be providing more information uh, indicating uh, race and ethnicity differentials uh, in the benefits uh, and the way benefits are working. Uh, and thereby giving Congress and the executive branch more of an opportunity to address those items. So I hope that information will be, will be helpful. I see Henry still in large picture on my screen. So Henry, I hope this means you, you, you have some, some further comments or, or questions to, to make. Uh, no, I don't. I think you can readjust that by changing your view, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's now devote the next uh, 20 minutes to questions from participants. We had a couple of questions submitted in advance, and I'll go to the Q&A on the Zoom. One uh, has to do with one of the first variables you talked about, Steve, and that's the 2.7% increase in average wages. This question says, are you revisiting that uh, to reflect any new information? And there was some implicit skepticism that wages of people earning under the wage base really had wage increases of that magnitude, or does this reflect increases from those above the wage base? Could you uh, focus on that uh, particular assumption? Oh, uh, happily, Bill, thanks. Yeah, this is obviously a really huge issue because uh, at this time last year and before, we had people in Congress who were very concerned with our and others' prognostications that the AWI might actually drop in 2020 and about remedies that might be approached. Here's the good news. The good news is that while at that time we were looking at aggregate national level wage reports from various sources, uh, based largely on surveys from individuals and from employers, uh, as it turns out, the actual wages upon which the average wage indexing series is based 
uh, come from something that's much more direct. The internal revenue source actually provides the W-2s from all workers in wage and salary employment uh, to the SSA administration. And SSA processes these, and we see these coming in starting, you know, March, April of a given year, representative of the prior year. At this point, we have the vast, vast majority of those available to us, and we have been monitoring them along the way. And I can tell you, based on the actual W-2 earnings reports from individuals, that is the basis for the roughly 2.7% average wage index increase that we're seeing. So yes, that's quite solid. Uh, it turns out that the earnings levels of people who had earnings in 2020 were stronger uh, and represented more time than had earlier been expected. So at this point, uh, we can tell, yes, it is evolving. I believe the date is around October 13, that we, uh, we will be having uh, the uh, next cost of living adjustment announced based on the September uh, uh, CPI, and we'll be announcing the average wage indexing at the same time. It, it might possibly be a little bit higher than 2.7, but we think that's very close to where it's actually going to be. And again, at this point, but not much before, we have actually our hands on the actual data records of W-2s from people who worked and were reported by their employers during 2020 to have, to have the real material. So at this point, that's a pretty solid number. And Steve, you mentioned the cost of living adjustment. One of our questions has to do with COLA uh, being close to 6% this year. How does an unusually high COLA affect the trust fund outlook? Is it significant? And would inflation need to remain high for a period of years to really have an impact? Well, it is absolutely true that anybody who is eligible for a benefit, whether or not they've even filed for their benefit as yet, uh, by the end of this year, will have their benefit affected for the rest of their life by the cost of living adjustment that we had this year. If it turns out to be on the order of 6%, by the way, there's still a fair amount of uncertainty on that because we do not, I think, as yet even have the August numbers for the CPI, much less the September. And then remember, it's the average of the July, August, and September. That would determine the actual next COLA. So you only have one of the three months, and we're just, uh, at this point, uh, unclear. It depends on what's going to come in those next two months. So it could be 6% or a little more higher, or it could be somewhat less, but it's almost certainly not going to be at the 3.1% level. Now, it is true, people's benefits will be elevated, those who are, are eligible uh, by the end of this year, and that will be an elevation for the rest of their life. There is the question, however, of uh, will, as happened in, I believe, 2008, when we had a 5.8% COLA uh, at that time, a, a very high COLA, we had no COLAs at all in the ensuing two years because the price is sort of receded and sort of re refixed. We're not really expecting that necessarily at this time. The other possibility uh, is that, in fact, the elevation in price levels that we've seen in 2000 and now in 2001 may find their way into elevation in wage levels. So that, uh, uh, and we've seen some indication of elevation of wage levels. Now, if that happens, we have both an elevation of price levels, which will give us higher benefits, but we also have an elevation of wage levels, then we'll have a nice balance. Because with an elevation of wage levels, we'll have a higher level of, uh, of earnings that will be subject to the payroll taxes. So we'll, so we'll have a balance. Time will tell whether we have a situation more like 2008 where the elevation in the, uh, uh, in the COLA uh, uh, was then later offset by lower ones or whether we'll have uh, on the other side of the coin an elevation possibly of, uh, of, of wage levels that will also tend to sort of offset the financial impact on the trust funds from, from the higher COLA. I want to remind our participants in the chat function, there are citations and links to many of the documents that Steve has referred to and others that elaborate on those documents. So please uh, do uh, make use of the chat function. Next question, Steve, is one that I guess an actuary loves, and that is, is the early retirement reduction factor too severe and is the delayed retirement credit too generous from an actuarial perspective? Uh, you want to weigh in on that one? Well, that really is a great question. And I mean, I, I can take you all the way back to like 
1979, when we were uh, actually working up the factors that largely are what we're dealing with now for the predecessor of the Greenspan Commission, the National Commission on Social Security. Uh, and uh, we worked on developing early retirement factors and delayed retirement credit factors that we expected would make sense relative to the mortality and, uh, and interest rate assumptions at the time. It turned out that those had, dare I say, pretty good legs for quite a while, in part because we also, in those estimations, uh, took into account the fact that people who decide to start their benefits at a higher age or later tend to be people who are going to live longer. And we actually uh, took that into account in developing those factors. However, mortality has improved since then, and we did not fully take into account expected future improvement. Congress said they wanted us to sort of develop factors that would best fit the experience then with a promise of making changes in the future. As it turns out, yes, the magnitude of the reduction factors, if you take your benefit before your normal retirement age, uh, soon to be 67, or the magnitude of the elevation of the benefit uh, if you decide to delay your benefit after 67 is a little larger than it ought to be in order to be exactly sort of cost neutral for the trust funds over time. So there is a bit of an encouragement for people to take their benefits at higher ages, which in the long run would be at uh, a little bit of an elevated cost to the trust funds. We don't want to dissuade people from doing that. We've seen a very distinct trend over the last 10 or 15 years towards people starting their benefits at higher ages. Whether that's due to the fact that everybody understands this sort of, as you indicate, build this fine actuarial point, or whether it's just a matter that people are living longer and healthier and seeing uh, the nature of work in the economy such that we can work to higher ages. Uh, either way, we're, we're seeing that effect. So yes, at the next round, we might see some, some change in these factors. But on the other hand, if we did, and I don't want to foretell this because we never try to foretell potential changes in law, but if we have an elevation in the normal retirement age, then the factors around that will, will come to be uh, more appropriate. Because life expectancy- Can I inter interrupt and ask a question Please. that takes off on this? Steve, you spoke flatteringly of the uh, suggestion of making an increase in the retirement age, uh, a keying it to lifetime earnings history. Uh, do you see, uh, would you favor doing the same for these actuarial adjustment provisions? Oh, that's, that's a great question. First of all, Henry, as you, as you so well know, I mean, we actually, we never favor anything one or the other. We do try to like answer questions best we can, but, but interpreting what you're saying, I, I, I think what you're suggesting is perhaps that if we recognize that people who tend to start their receipt of benefits at say age 62, as opposed to a higher age, if in general, those individuals tend to have a shorter life expectancy, than people who delay their start of benefits to a higher age, should we adjust, should we come up with factors that really reflect that, that take into account people who start their benefits at a younger age? That uh, is not what I was them. suggesting, Steve. Oh, okay. Uh, what I was asking is whether you would apply different adjustment factors to people with high average earnings than to people with low average earnings. Uh, we, we certainly could. That is not something that is built in. Uh, to the system now. I guess what I would suggest is that the nature of the PIA formula that, that ramps up the level of the actual basic PIA benefit is, is the item that the system at this point is utilizing to try to accomplish that. So, uh, uh, I mean, if, for instance, some, you know, if Henry, you have, you're working at the taxable maximum all the time, and I'm working at only half the taxable maximum your replacement rate, your benefit relative to your average earnings is going to be a lot lower than mine. So even if you take advantage of waiting till age 70, when you and I approach that age sometime in the distant future, even if you wait until age 70 to start your benefits. Second uh, time you, around. There you go. And, and take advantage of the delayed retirement credit. Uh, that will only partially offset, we believe, uh, the fact that your, your benefit replacement rate from the primary insurance amount formula is giving you a much lower ratio of, of, of basic benefit to your lifetime average earnings. So a very good point. And I guess the, the intent of the program is that the PI formula, the progressivity in that formula uh, should hopefully account for what you're suggesting. 
Uh, but 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 it, but it's a good point. We could, on top of that, also have, based on your earnings level, have the uh, delayed retirement and reduction early retirement reduction factors also modified based on uh, based on what your lifetime career earnings level is. I don't know that I've heard that particular suggestion made before, but now that you've said it here in public with with the with the probably many viewers that Bill has garnered to come today, uh, we might well hear that as a proposal <laughs> coming up yet. So you, you, you've just increased our workload. Thank you, Henry. <laughs> Glad to oblige. The next uh, question, folks, is on the DI program. Uh, can you describe uh, in more detail the potential impact of the boomer generation on the DI program and how it mirrors impacts to the OASI program? I might add another academy task force is on older worker retirement security, and its focus is on older workers in jobs that are physically demanding that really they are no longer able to do, but they don't meet the DI definition and they're too young to apply for a social security old age benefit. Uh, many boomers in that category, any uh, comments on the impact of the boomer generation on DI? Uh, that is really a great question. This is a little bit like sort of like replaying a little bit of past history. Many will remember that back up in, you know, in the eighties and the nineties, a lot of people were getting very concerned about the increasing cost of the disability insurance program. Uh, we tried to indicate at the time, a lot of that was again, because of demographics. Remember the slide we had earlier about as the boomers are moving more and more above age 65, that's increasing the share of our adult population over 65. Well, exactly the same thing happened back between 1990 and 2010, as the boomers were crossing over the threshold, uh, moving above age 45, the share of our adult, that is say uh, working age population, say between 25 and 65, the share that was between 45 and 65 where most of our disability applicants and recipients are, was increasing quite dramatically. We had a big shift uh, in the 25 to 65 age range across that period and ergo, the cost of disability rose very considerably relative to the uh, payroll or the GDP in that period. However, it was crystal clear that that would top out. Uh, and as the boomers then stopped moving more and more into 45 to 65 and were moving above 65, that would end. And that's exactly what is, what is seen. That is why the cost of the disability program, while it rose considerably between 1990 and 2010, because of that demographic effect, has now really essentially leveled off. And that's why really, we're, we're seeing uh, the relatively lower cost in disability and, and the much more extended period uh, of, of not having the trust funds uh, depleted. And, and the gigantic question on that were on the slides earlier is the incidence rate we've had, which are on an age sex adjusted basis, not really considering this age shift, will those incidence rates stay at the kinds of levels we've had lately? In the two or three years before the pandemic started, our incidence rate was four per thousand individuals who are insured, not yet receiving a benefit. And uh, our long-term uh, estimate is that that will rise up to five per thousand in the next 10 years. Will that occur? That's something we're going to be reassessing because at this point, the drop in that incidence rate has been quite dramatic uh, and was at a much lower level pre-pandemic when we thought we were in a rel relatively stable period. So we have a couple more questions, Steve. This is one I think I can guess your answer to. When do the trustees assume that the pandemic will conclude, at least in terms of its impact on Social Security? Oh, wow. Well, at this point, we are assuming that basically from an economic point of view, we'll be back to our stable sort of uh, uh, steady as you go for employment level about the middle of 2023. We're projecting that elevated mortality uh, from the pandemic will uh, be last seen essentially in 2023, uh, only a 1% elevated level above what we might've expected otherwise uh, at that point. But of course, uh, as I think uh, you indicated initially, and I think Henry certainly did also, there's nothing but uncertainty associated with this time period. Uh, we will see uh, the Delta variant that is now uh, uh, affecting us so strongly uh, we're hoping that that will wane away in the not too distant future, but another is concerns about the mu variant. And uh, again, thanks again to the panel you pulled together of uh, epidemiologists that were so helpful to us along with many others uh, in thinking through and understanding uh, the nature of this virus. 
We're not past it yet. We're hoping that these expectations in this trustees report uh, will be a worst case scenario, but we're prepared for continuing to, to, to recalculate. Uh, and, and looking forward, if you convene those same epidemiologists again, please uh, bring us back in the picture, Bill, because we, we want to hear what their latest thinking is also. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Then the question I'm sure you're getting asked too much, but it's on people's minds, and that is, what took the report so long this year? Um, and is there any way that in the future it can be released closer to the April 1st statutory requirement? Well, you know, it, as it happens, if you look about the history, the first year of any new administration, there tends to be uh, some delay. Obviously, it takes a while for the new team to come in, uh, as uh, I think you and you and Hank indicated earlier, that uh, that our trustees are actually uh, cabinet members plus our own commissioner Kololo, uh, uh, and it it takes a while for especially new cabinet members of Treasury, Labor, and HHS to get their footing, to get in, uh, sometimes to to actually get in the door and get confirmed, and to amass the staff around them to fully consider what changes they might want. Uh, uh, there have been years when we've had a new administration come in where there's very little happening that is different anywhere in the economy uh, or in the population. And therefore, it might be a relatively quick transition to uh, uh, move to the trustee support on the first year of an administration. This is obviously a very big change year. The 2020 trustees report, the last and the last administration did not, as mentioned earlier, reflect the pandemic. So we had, a, a, we had a, a large amount of work on our plate here to work through what were seen to be pandemic implications. We in our office did get a head start, as mentioned in the November 24 uh, publication that we put out on the web, it's still sitting there, uh, that was some help. But of course we had a new team uh, and uh, time was necessary to really bring them fully up to speed and get all of their thoughts about where we thought we should be with the pandemic and all the other assumptions that were built in there. So uh, the combination of uh, a new administration plus extraordinary circumstances under the pandemic uh, really contributed. I think earlier on, on, on another podcast uh, the last week, somebody indicated that uh, there was something on the order of 150 days uh, past the desired April 1 date here, but it was over 100 days, I believe, in the first year of uh, the prior administration, and there was uh, no pandemic to be dealt with at that time. So I think, you know, first years, the other one that was, was a very long delay, of course, was in the year of the uh, enactment of the Affordable Care Act. So things happened, but we were hopeful we had uh, mitigated some of the concerns about the delay by putting out our November 24 uh, item on the web. And I know you were well aware of it, Bill. Uh, and I know also that uh, members of Congress who were considering uh, dare I say bills, sorry for the, sorry for the, you know, tripping on your name there, but, but who are putting together legislative proposals, uh, we're well aware of that also. Uh, and I think uh, enjoyed having an, an updated projection to work off of. So we are, our, I, I can share with you that our trustees and our trustees working group are very bent on the idea of, yes, let's get it out much earlier next year. We're having a little bit of a slow starting point because we were as late as we were this year, but uh, we're hoping to have it in, in a month starting with a letter A, but maybe a different one than August next year. <laughs> well, Steve, thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't take advantage of your mentioning Acting Commissioner Kololo Kijikazi. Uh, she is one of two recipients of our annual Robert and Bull Award. The award event is November 9th. Please go on our website. And if you want to join in the honoring of Kololo and Bob Greenstein, uh, and we have uh, with us two prior recipients of that a uh, wonderful award. Steve was our first Ball Award winner and Henry uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, let me thank you again, Steve and Henry in absentia to uh, Tracy. I hope all of you found that while this may have been one of the later webinars on the trustees report, I hope you'll rate it as one of the more informative and objective and um, enlightening. Uh, thanks to all of you who did sign up and for your participation. Have a great rest of the day.